this is a little talk I want to give on a hands-on guide to Google Data. And uh, the genesis of this, uh, this talk is uh, Google has offered these tools to people, Google Correlate, Google uh, Trends, and Google Consumer Surveys. And they're very powerful and interesting tools. But there's no book you can read. There's no instruction manual. There's uh, academic papers, but they usually aren't detailed enough to really <laughs> show how to do things. So we decided to write a little paper that was really hands-on, that served as a model of how to use this data to do some, ask some interesting questions. And the thought was that then other people could follow <coughs> the footsteps and use the same data and answer uh, questions of their own. So this is coming out in a publication by Sage about, I forget what it's called, social science and big data or something like that. Um, but I, uh, there's a written paper that goes along with it, and uh, I'd be very happy to hear of your experiences in using this, or if you have questions about what you can, what you can do and how things are interpreted, and so on. So this talk is going to be just a kind of quick pass through to give you a preview of coming attractions, you know, the previews <laughs> are where all the exciting scenes are, and the paper itself spells out a uh, number of the details. All right, so I mentioned there were three Google tools that you could use for social science research, and the first one I'm going to talk about is Google Correlate, and what that does is it will show you the queries, queries are what the user types in, that are most correlated with a cross-section of data that you input state-wise data, or a time series of data. It could be at a weekly or monthly frequency. And on the cross-section, <coughs> right now, it's only U.S. states. Time series, you can do time series in uh, many, if not all, of the countries that we service. And uh, then the second tool I'm going to talk about is Google Trends. That shows you an index of activity for specific queries or categories of queries that you upload to Google Trends, so you find the queries that are most correlated with a given time series. And then finally, the last thing is this Google Consumer Surveys, which is a relatively new product. That's a lightweight, quick, and inexpensive way to make surveys of, uh, of internet users. And I'll describe how it works in a minute. But let me just get a show of hands so I understand the audience here. How many of you people have looked at Google Correlate ever? Only a no, small number, okay. How many of you ever looked at Google Trends ever? All right, much larger, that's good. And then how many of you looked at or used Google Consumer Surveys? Hey, all right, we got one over there in the corner. Okay, that's good. That's, that's about what I figured, so I think this talk should be related to pretty well. All right, let's we'll start with Google Correlate. And I'm gonna jump right into a practical problem. What you wanna do is you wanna predict house sales over time build a predictive model, and um, how would you do that using Google Trends? Well, you go to FRED, and FRED is a Federal Reserve Economic Database by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and you go through and you find the series that you're interested in. What I did is I picked the series New One Family Houses Sold, and you can download that data, and there's some little pull-down menus, and you do it from January 2004 to the present. That particular series is available monthly, and the only reason we started in 2004 is that's when the Google data starts, so it's not necessarily helpful to download data before that. You get a CSV file, and it has a few comments and things in it, so you look at it, clean it up, <coughs> and then you upload it to Google Correlate, and Google Correlate will whir for a second, and it'll find a bunch of terms, a bunch of queries that are correlated with that new family houses sold. And so the first thing you do is you can look at the data and see if these things make sense. And then after you play around with a little bit in that tool, you can export it from Correlate back down to CSV file. And then you can load it into your favorite <laughs> statistical package. So here's what the screenshot looks like. And uh, here you've got blue <laughs> is that housing data I just described. Red are the queries for Tahitian nani juice. <laughs> yes. 
So that brings up this important idea of spurious correlations. Because we have, of course, hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of queries there. And just by chance, something could be correlated with something else. <coughs> An exhaust sound, that's the next one. I don't know how well you, you can, the guys in the front row can see this. Greater online, so on. So a few of these things that seem like they're uh, kind of spurious. But then you get into some meat. It says 80-20 mortgage, appreciation rate, home appreciation, help you sell, new home builder, uh, <coughs> bostonworks.com. And if you look at the correlation over there on the left-hand side, that Tahitian Nani juice is 0.98 and 80-20 mortgage is 0.979. So it's off by like the third decimal point. And I think, just knowing what we know about the world, that if you're interested in predicting in the future terms that are related to real estate like 80-20 mortgage are likely to be more predictive than things like Tahitian Nani juice, which are more or less a one-time event. So you have to use a little judgment here. But what we do then is we download that data and we feed it into a model that we developed at Google. And our model, uh, when I say we, I really should attributed to the person who did all the work is a fellow named Steve uh, Scott, who uh, works on my team, has a PhD in statistics from Harvard, and he is a uh, confirmed Bayesian statistician and worked, uh, worked to develop a system we call Bayesian Structural Time Series. Now, the way it works, and, and this is, I'm going to literally wave my hands here because I don't want to get into uh, a lot of the details. It tries to decompose the time series into a trend, a uh, seasonal component, and then a regression component. And the regression component is built out of using these queries uh, as predictors for the, uh, the uh, series you're trying to produce. But the important point is, with a lot of time series, they'll be highly seasonal, they'll often have a trend, and you want to model all three of these pieces together in a way that is uh, a lot <coughs> easier to understand the underlying dynamics of the phenomenon. Um, and then, just as a one more footnote on the method, it does a Bayesian variable selection, so it selects the predictors that are most useful in predicting the regression part of the time series. And it also uses what's called Bayesian model <laughs> averaging, where you're actually not using the output of a single model that you're using an average over typically four or 5,000 models, okay? So this, this last point about uh, Bayesian model averaging, this is a very important idea in machine learning, big data, that um, you typically want to use ensembles of models. You get better predictive modeling by using a collection of models than by using any single model on its own. Uh, this is somewhat frustrating from the viewpoint of science, because in science, we want to say, oh, I've got the right model. And he says, no, I've got the right model. And then you get into this back and forth about who has the right model. But from a pure prediction point of view, usually you do better by averaging these models than you would by trying to pick the single best one. And that shows up very strongly in, uh, in this work, although you know, I don't have time to talk about it in detail. OK, so we run this into our black box, this Bayesian. Uh, structural time series. And by the way, if you're you, if you're our users, you can download this from Crayon and play with it yourself. It's all uh, open source and available to everyone. And we find out that our best predictors are summarized in this little bar chart. And when I say best <coughs> predictors, what I mean is the predictors that are most likely to show up in these models. So this is the <coughs> probability of being in the model. Uh, so those, we have 5,000 models we're running, and it looks like appreciation rate showed up in virtually 100% of them. And then about 50% of them, IRS 1031 showed up. IRS 1031 is a tax form you use for deferring capital gains on housing. Century 21 realtors, real estate purchases, 80-20 uh, mortgage mentioned earlier. Real estate appraisal shows up as a negative coefficient in this regression. That's what the black means. Um, and typically in this case, even though it's, of course, 
on its own, it likely has a positive correlation as part of the regression. It's uh, negatively correlated uh, in this uh, in this framework. So there's our little model, and that's what the in-sample fit looks like. So it's really pretty remarkable. With just a small number of predictors, you get this uh, phenomenal fit using the seasonal component. You can see the seasonality. Using the trend component, you can see the recession. And then using the regression component, which is the frequency of occurrence of these queries, you can get quite a tight uh, in-sample fit. Now, of course, we all know that in-sample is not is going to be uh, an exaggeration of how well things work out of sample. You can take the same predictors and the same basic structural model and uh, do a one step ahead out of sample forecast. You can do it using the BSTS. It's a little bit expensive from a computational point of view. It takes a few hours to run. So for this example, I just used a simple water regressive regression of order one, contemporaneous query data, and said uh, in this line, the black line is the true series. The uh, red line is what you get with a simple AR model to say this period depends on last period. And then the uh, green line is what happens if you supplement that with the query data. So you get about a 23% 20 improvement in the mean absolute error for a one step ahead forecast. Uh, using this uh, technology, and that's 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 pretty good. I mean, that's uh, that's rather uh, helpful to be able to do this one step ahead. But I want to emphasize that we're not really predicting the future with this model. We're predicting the present because we're looking at the contemporaneous queries, which arrive pretty much in real time, and we're using that to forecast the housing starts which arrive with a month lag because it takes a month to get around to reporting this data. So it's what sometimes uh, you hear economists talk about now casting. We're not forecasting, we're now casting because we're looking at the contemporaneous correlation between the queries, housing related queries, real estate related queries, and real estate activity. And it can be the same thing with unemployment data or with mortgage data or all sorts of other stuff. Okay. And the group that's most interested in this kind of now casting of getting sort of you know, taking the pulse of the economy, those would be typically central banks like the Fed and the Bank of England and the European Central Bank and so on. There is this nice uh, story from uh, the New York Times in 2008 when Obama's economic team came in and started planning what kind of stimulus package they wanted to present to Congress. They were working with six week old data. And the economy had dramatically decelerated during that six week period. And when you're in a crisis and things are moving very rapidly, uh, it's really helpful to have now cash, to have a better estimate of what the uh, economy looks like. And, and I think this and other kinds of data uh, have, a, have a real promise of helping to do that. Because you think about it, uh, Wal Walmart knows how much they sold in their stores yesterday. GDP takes three months to compile, and then it's revised two more times. All right? And uh, now from MasterCard, you can go to MasterCard. Anybody with a few thousand dollars can go say, um, I would like the aggregate data on charges on MasterCard by day, by region, by type of retail establishment, and you can just buy that data, which is much, much better than what happens with the uh, data, official data, in the sense that it's much more timely. So maybe not as deep or as detailed as some of that official data, but it does help in, in terms of this doing this, this kind of now casting. Okay, so in the paper, I lead you through each of these steps and you can do it. And by the way, I should say, this is just the model we used. I would encourage people to try a variety of models on this because we made choices about how we're going to do model selection, how we're going to model seasonality, and I'm sure that we didn't have the uh, last word in that. There are lots of other things you could do. Next thing I did, as I said, let's look <coughs> at the cross section. So we're going to take the data of looking at the biggest price declines from peak to trough over the course of the recession. 
I just happened to come across this uh, in the newspaper. Somebody had compiled the, the change in prices by uh, state. And what I did is I took that data and I fed it in to the Google Correlate mm -hmm. and said, find me the queries that are the most predictive of this state-by-state -state price decline. And you press the button and bang, out comes the most correlated query is short sale process. Short, short, short sale process is when you uh, default in your mortgage and so they sell the house or you or the, or the bank sells the house and you uh, uh, sale price is less than the value of your mortgage. And so there were a lot of people who were interested in doing that and if you look at this map, the color indicates the magnitude of the decline and the first thing that jumps out at you is the biggest declines occurred in the so-called sand states. That is California, Nevada, Arizona, and Florida, where the real estate crisis <coughs> was most extreme. So it looks uh, pretty good. <coughs> we can do the same sort of thing I did in the last chart, download the whole set of uh, queries, and then build a predictive model, in this case using cross-section modeling. And it turns out the predictors that were chosen were underwater mortgage, Toontown Invasion Tracker, uh, that's a game, uh, Toontown Invasion, HARP 3.0, that's a homeowner's asset release program, short sale process, and pool heater. So the pool <laughs> heater you kind of understand because after all it is California, Arizona, Nevada, and Florida. HARP uh, is a bit of a, a spurious regressor, but I want to use the same argument I used before if I'm trying to predict the future, I don't want to choose terms that are going to be one-time occurrence, right? And you would, might well think that HARP and, well, HARP again would be a one-time occurrence, but it'd be queries related to uh, homeowner uh, uh, refinance. By the way, HARP 3.0 never happened. At HARP 1 and HARP 2, people kept hoping for HARP 3, which is why they were querying Google for news on it, but it never actually uh, So then I said, we'll supply some judgment. And I mentioned to you this was a Bayesian model, so Bayesian models are set up to apply some judgment. And uh, we kind of dropped the, uh, gave a low prior probability to that, uh, that uh, Toontown stuff. And we end up getting uh, these three uh, predictors, the short sale process, harp, and pool heater. I guess we did get one, one uh, game. So we can do a actual defitted. This is all just in sample now but we've got the actual uh, occurrence of these price drops, and we've got the predicted occurrence of the price drops, and we get this uh, regression line that looks uh, pretty nice, <coughs> and I've highlighted the outliers, Nevada, Florida, Arizona, and California, the same states that I referred to uh, earlier. <coughs> so it's a way to take some time series, or in this case, cross-sectional data, uh, find a predictive model, and uh, we could, again, use this for, I mean, we could be much more sophisticated uh, in doing this, but at least this gives you a start of how to go to get the data, how to build a uh, baseline model, and then how to, uh, how to evaluate it. But much more can be done, of course. All right, so we were kind of emboldened by these fun things, and we uh, looked at a... Uh, data, this actually came from the New York Times, they had a story about uh, lifespans. And the story was the county with the longest lifespan in the U.S. is about, has about 85 years, which is comparable to Sweden. And there's the county with the shortest lifespan, which is about 67 years, which was actually comparable to Afghanistan, I think. They're both in the same state. Okay. Not Michigan, <laughs> just, just so you aren't worried, it wasn't Michigan, it was Virginia. And the one with the longest lifespan was up there around D.C., where they had these very, very wealthy uh, suburbs, and the shortest lifespan was up there in Appalachia, next to West Virginia. But it was incredible, the difference between these uh, areas, just from a geographic point of view. So we said, hmm, I wonder what queries are correlated with short lifespans, OK? 
Okay. Did exactly the same thing. Took the data. In our case, we used states. You could use county data. We fed the data into Google Correlate. <coughs> we hit the button and said, okay, what queries are correlated with a short lifespan? And the answer is blood pressure medication, <laughs> numero uno, Obama, <laughs> <laughs> against Obama, King James Bible online, about Obama, <laughs> prescription medicine, 40 caliber, 38 revolver. I mean, it's terrible. It's like this catalog of social ills. But in the same states where you observe short lifespans, you see prevalence of these queries in the states where you have long life fans. Fans are relatively rare. Mark of the Beast, Glock 40, Lost Books of the Bible. I mean, it goes on and on. And you kind of read that list. I guess only the people in the first few rows can, can actually see it. But you read that <laughs> list, and it's like, oh my God, what the, what the, what, what, how terrible. Is this state level data? Yeah, that's state, state level data. data. Okay. And so here's what it looks like if we look at uh, negative of life expectancy, short lifespans, and uh, activity, search activity for blood pressure medication. Here I say medicine, I forget what it's medicine. <coughs> Uh, shows you what's going on. Where are those queries emanating from? The Confederacy, right? The Confederacy, that's where it's from. 100 years ago, that was the Confederacy, and it still has this, this uh, you know, social problems uh, of uh, the sort I'm, I'm alluding to. And you can build a little model of that. <laughs> Full figured woman. <laughs> that's a good predictor. Uh, blood pressure medicine, gunshot wounds, 40 caliber. So just a just little small point about statistics. In the previous case, we're looking at just the single correlations. Here we've got a regression model that says we're taking a combination of these variables to find out the best predictors. And then you might ask, what is all this Obama stuff? And it turns out what it is are you go to Google Suggest, and you can type in Obama says, it'll be, Obama says he is God, Obama says he's a Muslim, Obama. There are all kind of negative queries about uh, Obama. And, uh, and so if you look in these places where there's a negative attitude uh, towards Obama, there's obesity, uh, blood pressure medication, gunshot wounds, I mean, those are places where, not surprisingly, you have a short lifespan uh, at the state level. So it's a sobering, but I think informative uh, investigation. Here's one that's a little more fun, maybe. We go to Google Trends. I've done Google Correlate now. And this is one where we type in queries for hangover and queries for martini recipe. And you see queries for hangover peak every Sunday. <laughs> for martini recipe, peak every Saturday. You see there's a one period lag in the series generally. You've got the peaking just a little before, and, they, and of course the big outlier there is New Year's Eve on the uh, martini recipe and New Year's Day for the hangover cure. So it's a pretty broad thing. And some of you, if you're in economics or statistics, you might have seen Granger causality or Granger predictability. We tried to ask, does a time series have predictive power? For another one, and I can tell you this, this is like the textbook case. If you look at the queries for martini, they are definitely predictive for queries for hangover. And you know, just like you think vodka, bourbon, anything else. Um, although it is a kind of funny, you, wouldn't, you, you don't really want to call it causality because it could be completely different people who are querying for martini recipes and who have hangovers. <laughs> but it is still uh, <coughs> kind of a strong and, and striking regularity. And you can also compare across countries. So you can take that Google Trends data and say, I want to compare the US and the UK, and uh, you get a uh, picture of what that likes. And by the way, we did play around with this. There's, there are other holidays where partying is a big deal, and you could get the same, same kind of phenomenon. But to get something serious, let's shift back to an interesting economic phenomenon, namely unemployment. And uh, in the US, there's several measures of unemployment reported. One is a measure of the unemployment rate, which is where they call people up and say, are you or your family 
out of work and looking for work, you or anyone in your family out of work or looking for work. And there's also what they call the filing for the initial claims for unemployment benefits. So if you became unemployed, first thing you do is you would go to Google, I hope, and you would say, where's the unemployment office? How do I file for unemployment? How long do employment benefits last? And so on, so on, so on. And so here we looked at the um, model of the initial claims, the filings from the state employment offices for the actual initial claims for unemployment, and we compared that to the query filing for unemployment, and look at the fit. It is, I think, truly remarkable. The actual is the black line, which you can barely see. The uh, trends data on filing for unemployment is the blue line, <coughs> and then that base is just a baseline autoregressive of order one model where you're using the sort of pure properties of the time series itself. So as before, if you want to try to build, do some modeling out of this, you would like to combine the time series piece of just forecasting the series from its own past behavior with the trends piece. And here we're interested in a one week ahead forecast, but again, we're using the contemporaneous data for the uh, trends, since that's a basically available real time. So you have this mixed frequency. And uh, as you can see, you get a quite a remarkable fit. So it's, uh, it's really very helpful in, uh, in describing this. By the way, people ask what the peaks are, <coughs> and uh, this is right after Christmas when all the seasonal workers are laid off. And this one in here, see how regular that is? That's uh, basically, that's, that's Michigan. That's the uh, auto industry tends to close down during August when they retool the assembly lines. And mm -hmm. so all those workers say, oh gosh, I guess I'm unemployed for a few weeks. Better go get the unemployment benefits. So that's what's going on during, uh, during those periods. Okay, now, these are all kind of predictive papers. But we might want to look at papers that are looking at some hypothesis or trying to do inference. And uh, this is one example of a nice paper by a couple graduate students at Stanford, Scott Baker and Andy Bradkin. They were interested in the question that economists ask was how do unemployment benefits affect employment? Because after all, if you've got really cushy unemployment benefits, you might take your time in getting back to a job. And uh, you know, people have different interpretations of this. Uh, one interpretation is you kind of wait for a really good job where you search more <coughs> intensely because you have those unemployment benefits. Other people said no. You have really good unemployment benefits and you won't search as much. So the debate rages back and forth. What they did is they looked at job search intensity using the Google searches for jobs, not Steve Jobs, that's a negative <laughs> qualifier, right? So we have that capability in there. And uh, it turns out that the individuals who have the unemployment search uh, insurance, and this was done at the state uh, level, so I should have said individuals, individuals in states where there was a lot of UI insurance, 30% search 30% less than those not on UI, and the search is close to the exhaustion of the UI benefits. Uh, they searched <laughs> twice as much so as the deadline was approaching, these people became more and more uh, anxious, and in fact, when they extended the unemployment benefits, so there was a couple of extensions where they said, yeah, it was 60 weeks, now it's 90 weeks, and so on. Then people did search less intensely the week after that announcement, but then a week later they were back to pretty much the normal rate of uh, search. So this was nice because this was a way to really examine how people searched for unemployment during this period of time where there were several shocks to the system and we learned something about what the uh, you know, what the search uh, behavior is like to help, maybe not resolve, but at least contribute to the understanding of, uh, of this behavior. This is another interesting one. This is a fellow at Stephen, uh, Seth, uh, Seth Stevens Davidovitz at uh, Harvard, wrote a very interesting thesis looking at how many votes Obama lost to racism. Of course, very sensitive topic. But what they did is they looked at Democratic votes in 2004 as compared to Democratic vote in 2008. 
And in some places, the vote was lower than it was in previous times. And those were exactly the places that were, where there was basically race, racist uh, searches in those areas. So the loss of votes in certain areas was in fact correlated with the prevalence of, uh, of uh, racist uh, queries. <coughs> And so he estimates that the racism cost Obama about four percentage points of the popular votes. And this is interesting because these are these sensitive issues are the issues that are very, very hard to resolve or understand by surveys or by other mechanisms, but people are uh, telling Google things that they would never tell uh, in a survey. So I mentioned surveys, and let me turn now to a uh, Another tool, the first two tools I talked about, Correlate and Trends, those are both completely free. Everybody can use them. It's, uh, this one, I have to say, there is a charge, but it's a relatively minor charge. So the way it works is you have a user bouncing along the internet, and they come up to a paywall. And here's an example. I'm searching Bloomberg Business Weeks, and uh, I've made a couple searches, and then it came up and popped up a survey and says, answer these questions, to get in, answer this short survey to continue reading this page. And it gave me, have you ever purchased anything? And we click this. So the point is, when you have a paywall in your web application, what happens is you're given a survey to answer to give you access to the content you're after. And where does that survey come from? Well, the survey comes from a, uh, survey writer who created the survey, uploaded it to Google Surveys, and then Google Surveys plops this survey down as a payment, <coughs> payment in terms of answering the question for, uh, for your access to the content, okay? And um, the survey writer pays 10 cents an answer <coughs> split between the publisher getting roughly half of that, and Google is getting the other half. And so the publisher's happy, because they're getting a payment, which is much higher payment they would get for any ad that would be there. The survey writer's happy because he gets this survey results back from thousands of people in literally a few days. And uh, who else is there? Oh, well, the, the uh, user, the consumer's happy because he gets access to this premium content that he wouldn't otherwise. So, kind of a win-win-win uh, situation. Uh, what, what do you think about the quality of the survey? Well, that's, I want to talk about that. That's, a, that's an excellent question. But let me, let, me get, let me get through the mechanics and then I'll talk about that. So this is the kind of thing, it's like a tweet of surveys. You have to write a very short question, just a few <coughs> answers. Only, you can have a screening question and then a content question. So this is an example. Uh, if you were asked to use one of these commonly used names for such a class, which you just say you belong in? be upper middle, you know, middle, and lower middle, etc. Uh, do you support Obama or Romney in the upcoming election? Uh, you could say, I prefer to buy products that are assembled in America. These are all surveys that we've run. First one was actually a uh, survey that was run by Pew Foundation using random digit dialing, and I just wanted to see how close did we get to what they got. Uh, do you support Obama or Romney? Well, obviously there were a lot of surveys that did that, so we were curious as to what they said. The one I prefer to buy products that are assembled in America, that's because a mobile phone company came to us and said, um, you know, we've got the only smartphone that's designed, engineered, and assembled in America. Should we tout that? Should we put, make that part of our marketing campaign? Well, let's see what people think about it. So let's take that first one, where we have another survey to compare it to. This is, in black, the responses to the Pew random digit dialing survey, where they ask this question. And the, whatever color that is, violet uh, is the answer from the Google Consumer Surveys. And you can see they really line up pretty well, I would say, pretty well. Um, the Pew Foundation then did a study comparing their surveys to, the, uh, to this uh, technology, and in general they found they were you know, pretty supportive of, of how it works. Now there are cases where it will fail. If you have internet-related questions, you know, how often do you use the internet? You're asking the people who are on the internet, so you're not going to get an unbiased sample of population. 
But uh, it is quite surprising that you get a pretty diverse set of uh, users. And we have, of course, uh, data from uh, the census, so we have some idea of the relationship between the characteristics of users in that geography and the, the inferred uh, gender and uh, uh, age and so on that we can get from the uh, Google data. And again, they line up they line up pretty well. So we're reasonably happy with this as a technology for certain kinds of surveys, maybe not across the board. but So it's fun to play with. As I say, it costs a dollar a. Um, Sorry, 10 cents an answer. So for $100, you get 1,000 answers. And uh, if you want to run a quick survey, <coughs> bang, you'll get your answers back within usually a day or a day and a half. So quite, quite, uh, quite useful tool for doing that. And if you want to do trial runs on question wording for big, more elaborate, more expensive surveys, this is a really good way to get the, uh, to do your uh, trials. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell you one last thing, and that's, that's a technique that we developed that combines this cheap survey mechanism with the Google Trends data I was telling you about before, and uh, we call it uh, survey amplification. And here's how you do it. You run a Google consumer survey asking some question, like, do you support Obama in the upcoming election? And then what you do is you associate with each response the city associated with the resident, resi uh, with the respondent, okay? And then you build a predictive model for the responder's answer using the Google Trends categories associated with that city, okay? So this is what social scientists have been doing for decades. They take answers to surveys and they take characteristics of the geo from where that survey came, like census data, age, income, gender, education, et cetera, and they build a little model that says, okay, these are the demographic predictors of responses to this survey, okay? So what we're doing is same idea, except in addition to those demographic <coughs> characteristics from census data, we're using all the query data from that geo as well. Not the individual queries. That would run into privacy issues. We're using the geographic uh, queries associated with the area. And so if we do that, we look at, uh, we look at the predictive model. Do I have it here? No. I didn't put up the uh, predictors, but uh, they, they, you know, they, they kind of make sense. I should have had a slide on that. Uh, but this is just looking at the predictive accuracy where you take the predictions for people in uh, supporting Obama, and then you take the actual vote share in the election, and you do a scatter plot, and you see there's a pretty strong relationship. And the outliers here are DC, Hawaii, and Utah. Okay? So there's a reason for each of those, and if you sort of pull those out, you see you get a pretty good fit. This is doing the same thing by DMA. You could do it by census tract, you could do it by congressional district, you could do it all sorts of ways. So you could build your model of the survey responses and then take that model and apply it to uh, other geographic uh, divisions and you can learn a lot about what the voting patterns look like just from a few thousand survey responses. Okay? Because we're looking for, use our predictive model that we built about the, uh, about the voting behavior. Now, last question, I told you about the cell phone case, and we ran the survey, do you, I prefer to buy products that are assembled in America, and we built a little model to predict those answers as a function of queries associated with the geo of the respondent. And here's what we got. The predictors were Chevrolet, firearms, weapons, country music, and trucks. So if you take your shotgun, hang it in the back of your Chevy truck, and drive down the road humming Stand By Your Man, <coughs> you are probably somebody who supports uh, several in America. So then what you can do is you can then take that data 
And for each geography in the U.S., you could assign a score based on this predictive model that says how likely that message is to resonate with the population. And what happens is the places where this is the most likely to resonate are South Carolina, West Virginia, West Virginia, South Carolina, and so on, and least likely are out there in uh, California. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about that is, yes, indeed, the answer to the question, should we tout this on our ads, yes, in the regions where it's going to be most effective. And it's hardly worth your while doing it in these other regions. We did a similar thing on this particular phone. It also had the characteristics that it was one of the few mobile phones. In fact, at this time, I think it was the only one where you could configure the color and trim of the phone. You could order it just made to your specifications. So we asked the question, I would like to be able to choose the color and look of my mobile phone, which was not possible three years ago, two years ago when we did this, and we found the areas of the country where that message resonated. And it's like the exact opposite. It's urbanistas, young women, 20s to 30s, interested in fashion and design, basically urban areas where people were sensitive to these issues. And so that's the aspect of your product that you would like to tout in the areas where that message would be receptive. So it's the same product, has different features, and you like to advertise those features where they're going to be the most uh, appreciated. So it's kind of a nice way to do uh, marketing targeting, political targeting, anything else. So I think that <coughs> pretty much wraps up what I wanted to say, but I would encourage you, go to Google Correlate, go to Google Trends, go to Google Consumer Surveys. There's lots of neat things you can do with these tools. I've just scratched the surface and I wanted to give you some examples of the kinds of things you can do, but kids, you can do this at home. You don't have to ask, <laughs> you don't have to ask mom and dad's permission. This is something where it's there, it's available, lots of interesting insights can come from it, and I encourage you to go forward and try it. Thank you. <laughs>